Good evening to everybody. I'm Roy Gutman, the President of the Council. I'm really pleased to have our speaker tonight, retired Admiral Fogo, to analyze the war in Ukraine. Robbie uh, Harris, who is the Chairman of the Board of Trustees, uh, put this program together uh, and will field the question and answer. Admiral Fogo was a four-star admiral when he retired two years ago. I looked it up and a quick scan in the internet says that there's is only as many as nine four-star admirals in the, uh, in the Navy. He's a graduate of the uh, Na Naval Academy. He spent a good part of his career as a submarine commander, and then he rose to take over multiple commands in Naples. Among them, and of course these are really long titles, but, uh, but you should know them, the commander of naval forces in Europe and Africa, the commander of the Allied Joint Forces Command, as well as commander of the U.S. Sixth Fleet. Wearing his different hats, he's uh, had to stay on top of developments in the Baltic and in the Black Seas, uh, both coasts of Africa, the Arctic, as well as the Mediterranean and the North Atlantic. It seems like everywhere except for the Pacific, in fact. He has had closely watched the evolution of great power competition involving the United States, Russia, and China. But he's a man who's unique, I think, in, in his uh, effort and his determination to view the Navy as an extended arm of American diplomacy. And he's maintained very close ties with American diplomats in Europe. He's observed uh, Russian military operations uh, intensively. Uh, he once summed up the Russian military style calling it a creature of habit at its base in the Baltic Sea. He said it's, it's done the same thing uh, that it's been doing, a high density of people, systems, and weapons, he said. And that seems to be what they're doing even today. We asked him tonight to address some of the big questions about the war in Ukraine that go beyond uh, the discussions, the, the, the two or three minute discussions that uh, occur in the evening news. How do you explain the poor performance of the Russian military? What more can NATO do to support with defensive weapons? Is there a counter to uh, the Russian military attack on Ukraine's major cities? And what of the Russian fleet in the Black Sea, which is now sitting there poised to attack the Ukrainian coast? Is the United States or its allies supporting weapons to the Ukrainian army to uh, fight the Black, the Black Sea fleet? And if not, why not? He has promised to give us his best answers to these and uh, several other questions. So Admiral, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. What a pleasure to be here. And you can see uh, a slide in front of you, which is a meme on the character of Vladimir Putin. It's part of my theme tonight, the boiling frog. And many of you know that uh, when you put the frog in a boiling pan with cold water and you slowly turn the rheostat on your oven up and that water comes to a boil, as legend would have it, uh, the frog doesn't really know that he's being cooked until he's cooked. And so my thesis here tonight is that the scenario that's taking place in Ukraine, as horrible as it is right now, was something that uh, we could have anticipated as far back as 2014. You see the stake on uh, Putin's plate is in the shape of Crimea. That is when he illegally annexed Crimea with little green men that just kind of walked in and took over. But it goes beyond just 2014. And uh, Robbie Harris and I uh, served together in the Pentagon. We've known each other for probably over 20 years. I don't want to date myself or Robbie, but... Uh, this even goes back to the time of 1986. We have an embedded video, and uh, while it's playing, I'm going to describe it for you. This is like something out of uh, the hunt for Red October. It's uh, the USS Yorktown and one other ship that went into the Black Sea to do what the Navy does best, projection of power, protecting sea lines of communications, and freedom of navigation. So operating off the coast of Ukraine at a time when the Russians did not recognize uh, our baseline to their baseline. They sent out the frigate Bezovatny, and Bezovatny actually rammed the USS Yorktown. You can see that taking place right now. Some would call it an elision because it wasn't a bow on to uh, side of hull, and thankfully it wasn't. As Bezovatny's uh, bow uh, uh, walked down the after part of USS Yorktown, I was told by uh, people that were there, including the officer of the deck, a friend of Robbie's and a friend of mine, Lieutenant Doug Crowder, that the anchor came off the Bezovatny, hooked one of the uh, Yorktown's uh, missile systems, Harpoon, actually turned it around, raked the deck, and also pulled off all the scaffolding alongside the ship. And finally, the anchor chain parted before Bezovatny maneuvered away. 
Now, the commanding officer of that ship was Captain Phil Durr, somebody else that Robbie knows and I know. He was my boss in the Pentagon at one time, and he became an admiral. Well, so does that Russian commanding officer. And uh, they were both uh, given a medal for this operation. It was a time that was very tense during the Cold War, and we rewarded commanding officers for this type of thing. But it is dangerous, and uh, it is unsafe and unprofessional on the part of the Russians something that happened before the breakdown of the Soviet Union, but I submit to you that it is their modus operandi. Next slide. We're gonna fast forward now to uh, 2007. And uh, I had the pleasure of serving as the executive assistant, the first executive assistant for another good friend, Naval officer and mentor, Admiral Mike Mullen. Now Admiral Mullen made it a priority to try to figure out how he was going to deal uh, with the Russian uh, Federation. And so he invited the Russian chief of defense to the Pentagon for one of his first uh, counterpart visits. This was very important because we had met uh, General Yuri Balievsky in NATO in the context of the NATO-Russia Council, which was a council formed to have a dialogue with the Russians to avoid mistakes and miscalculations like that, which you just saw play out before you with Bezovatny and uh, Yorktown. When we prepared for the meeting, Admiral Mullen said, you know, uh, I found out some information about uh, Balievsky. Uh, he was the head of the rocket forces, the strategic forces in Russia and in the Soviet Union. He grew up uh, in the Soviet Union and obviously achieved the same rank as Admiral Mullen as the chairman uh, of the Joint Chiefs of their Chief of Defense. But on the weekends, he likes to go out to his Dasha, his, uh, his country home in uh, Moscow, outside of Moscow, and tinker with cars old cars, classic cars with his son. So Admiral Mullen said, hey, why don't you figure out uh, something that would be cool to do during the coffee break? And uh, that's all he said. It was a message to Garcia, and I loved Admiral Mullen for that because it was always a challenge. One of my friends down the hall, who was a colonel and the executive assistant to the director of the Joint Staff, uh, had this 1973 Corvette that you see that he had restored. It was absolutely in mint condition. And the officer was uh, an A-10 pilot, so hence the license plate hog driver. The A-10 is the tank killer. The Ukrainians wish they had some of those right now. And I asked him if we could do a static display of his car on the mall entrance of the Pentagon so General Balievsky could come out and take a look at it. Now, we thought it was going to be a static display, but Admiral Mullen said, you got the keys? Yes, sir, I do. He goes, give them to me. Now, we threw a real wrench into the schedule and surprised the Russian handlers that were with Balievsky, including some GRU officers who were intelligence officers, and they wanted to micromanage this visit down to the minute. So thinking we were going to go to coffee, we took a left turn instead of a right turn in the halls of the Pentagon and walked outside. Balievsky's eyes lit up when he saw this car. And then the surprise came not just to the Russians, but to the owner of that vehicle, when Admiral Mullen said, you want to take it for a spin? That wasn't part of the deal. I don't think Balievsky was insured by USAA to drive this vehicle, and it was worth a lot of money. Balievsky said yes, and he got in the car, and uh, I found out a lesson learned, and that is that the stick shift on a Russian vehicle is in the exact opposite direction of an American vehicle. <laughs> so Admiral Mullen had to give him a driver's lesson. And he, uh, he probably burn, almost burned out the clutch going around the parking lot. But once he got the hang of it on the second uh, lap, Mullen said, give it a go and take it around again. This was an incredible icebreak. And the two men had a great discussion uh, throughout the rest of the day and at Tingy House at the CNO's headquarters. Valievsky warned at the time, if you don't stop the encroachment of the Russian Federation with NATO, then Russia, as a first step, is going to pull out of the Conventional Forces Europe Agreement, the CFE. The value of the CFE is its transparency, its dialogue. We talk to them and they talk to us about exercises that take place, exercises that could turn in to crossing someone's border and lead to a war. And true to form, within a few months, the Russians conducted a soft withdrawal of CFE, and several years later, a hard withdrawal from that treaty. Balievsky was replaced uh, by an officer named General Nikolai Makarov. Makarov was, uh, by trade, a logistician, and his job was to go in and reform the Russian 
armed forces because they were too heavy, too corrupt, didn't have the right kind of equipment, and their training was terrible. He didn't get much time to do that before he was given the order to proceed with the Russian Joint Force through the Chuchki Tunnel into Georgia and attack Georgia in 2008. The Russians picked a perfect time to do this. It was in August of 2008 when all of NATO was on vacation. It threw a, a real curveball to us. We responded as best we could, so did the Georgians. And that war ended up in somewhat of a stalemate with Russia taking control of Abkhazia and South Ossetia, which are part of uh, uh, the Russian Federation today. And so you can see the way this thing played out on the right, and you can see the impact on the uh, geographic map of Georgia on the left. We responded with over a billion dollars of aid. Uh, Vice President Biden at the time went in there and provided reassurance to the Georgians that we we're gonna help rebuild their country. Their port facilities were destroyed and a lot of their infrastructure was destroyed. We had American trainers in the country at the time the Russians were slinging in some of these short range ballistic missiles and attacking, uh, Ukraine, or attacking Georgian bases throughout the country. And after this, uh, it was decided that we needed to have a reset with the Russians. And you remember this famous photo and this famous meeting between Secretary of State Hillary Clinton Minister of Foreign Affairs of Russia, uh, Lavrov, when they pressed that reset button in 2009. Things proceeded pretty well from there. The Russians got our attention. Uh, we started to do things like reinitiate the Russia work plan. The Russia work plan was something that both uh, ministers of defense and both the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the chief of defense in Russia had to agree to. It was a plan that started on the 1st of January and went through the 31st of December every year. Every day was mapped out on uh, personnel exchanges. Uh, chaplains would visit the Russian Federation. The bands would go to the Russian Federation. The Russians would come here and do concerts at the Kennedy Center. But more importantly, we would understand a little bit about Russian doctrine and the manner in which they conduct warfare in the field. We actually had the Russians participating in ball tops up until about 2013. And those Rapuchka class amphibious craft that you see sitting off the coast of Odessa were running around the Baltic in an exercise that was commanded by an American and intended to reduce tension and conflict mistakes and miscalculations in that body of water. We even went to the extent that during the Sochi Winter Olympics, and that was uh, the signature series coming out party for the Russian Federation and for Vladimir Putin. He spent a lot of money, uh, probably over a billion dollars in building that Olympic village in a place where he has his vacation homes. We had USS Mount Whitney and USNS Spearhead in the Black Sea. At the time, the Sixth Fleet commander was Admiral Phil Davidson, later Indo-PACOM Indo commander. And uh, I relieved Admiral Davidson, and he told me the reason that we were there was in the event that there was some kind of a problem at the Olympics. There were Americans at the Olympics. Uh, some of our uh, White House officials went over and attended. And in the event of a terrorist attack, we had the wherewithal to get people out. We even had an open phone line, like a hotline. It was an unclassified line with the commander of the Black Sea Fleet. Imagine how that changed. Now, at the very end of the Olympics, the revolution in Maidan, in Ukraine, in Kyiv, took place. That incensed Vladimir Putin. And his response was to invade Crimea and take Crimea back. Because to Russians, it was always part of their territory. They lost it in uh, uh, treaties and resolutions after world wars. They never liked it. And they walked in with little green men. And it looked as though they were 10 feet tall. They were professional. They had reformed. Perhaps Makarov had done some good by this time. General Valery Gerasimov had taken over as chief of defense. And he's still there eight years later. Now, it went well for the Russians in Crimea. They held an, a referendum. And whether it was legitimate or illegitimate, the majority said, we're going to stay as part of Russia. The Ukrainians lost their principal naval base. They shared a naval base with the Russians in Sevastopol. Uh, I've never been to Sevastopol, but I've been to Odessa. Odessa became the de facto Ukrainian naval base. During the crisis, the Russians pulled some hulks in front of Sevastopol. They sunk them in the harbor, and it was impossible 
for the Ukrainians to get their ships out. And so they lost about 75 or 80 percent of their fleet uh, firepower that was stuck in Sevastopol, and the Russians just took those ships and made them Russian Federation ships. This split families. I remember when I was in Odessa, I talked to members of the Ukrainian Navy officers whose brothers were serving in the Russian Navy. It came down to a choice. Do you want to be on the Ukrainian side or the Russian side? Some people chose the Russian side, others chose the Ukrainian side. And this one officer was telling me that his parents lived in Crimea, they were older. Both he and his brother, who was in the Russian Navy, had children, so grandchildren of these grandparents who could no longer travel to Ukraine. So a tragic situation and something that uh, portended what has happened here in 2022. Now that's me walking on the pier and the gentleman two to my left is Prime Minister Yatsunyuk. And the gentleman in the suit to my right is Ambassador Jeff Pyatt, who's been in Europe for a very long time. He's currently the ambassador to Greece, a phenomenal diplomat. We tried to help the Ukrainians rebuild their navy. They essentially had one capital ship, and that is the Hemet Sagadashny, which you see behind me flying that magnificent holiday colored flag, blue and gold over the bow. That ship was a former Federal Security Bureau Russian uh, coastal patrol frigate that the Ukrainians acquired during a time when they had better relations with the Russians, and they made it their flagship. And we had just come off that flagship where we had a cup of coffee and we talked about things and the future of the Ukrainian Navy, and they were so proud of it. It was immaculate. Everything was painted. The weapon systems on board were old, but there was a lot of pride in that ship. And hold that thought for later on in the presentation. Then in 2016, Vladimir Putin decided to consolidate some of his uh, victory in Crimea by building a bridge between the Russian Federation to the Crimea. And he did it in a record two years, very long bridge, very complicated. And it essentially covers the mouth of the Sea of Azov. And guess who was the guy driving the first truck across that bridge? There he is, Vladimir Putin. Had, had consolidated once again for the Russian people and restored uh, control and sovereignty of Crimea. So it obviously meant a lot to him. During this time, uh, I had left Sixth Fleet, come back uh, home here for a tour in the Pentagon and gone back as the commander of Naval Forces Europe, Naval Forces Africa, and uh, NATO's Allied Joint Force Command for the Southern Flank in Naples, Italy. Uh, I learned a lesson from Admiral Grog Johnson, who was one of my predecessors, because he always brought in U.S. ambassadors from different regions, and he would invite the CNOs or chiefs of defense from those countries that our ambassadors uh, were resident in. So we held a Black Sea Ambassadors Conference, and this is it, in 2018. And uh, we had ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors from uh, uh, Ukraine, from Bulgaria, Romania, Turkey and Georgia, not Russia. And we had the CNOs from all those countries, the, the, the country CNO, so the Bulgarian, uh, the Ukrainian CNO. The Ukrainian CNO was Admiral uh, Brancha. He said at the time that he was creating a mosquito fleet. A mosquito fleet, because he didn't have a big Navy, was gonna be a, a small set of patrol craft. And he announced very boldly that he was uh, unhappy with the situation in the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov and that he intended to challenge the Russians, but he didn't tell us how. Uh, the Sea of Azov is regulated by a treaty between the Russian Federation and uh, the country of Ukraine that dates back to 2003. But by this time, the Russians were not adhering to freedom of navigation and commerce under the Kerch Bridge into the Sea of Azov and into the Ukrainian port of Mariupol. Even back then, the Russians were trying to uh, strangle commerce in and out of Ukraine to weaken that. And Admiral Vornchenko's response was one day in late 2018 to send three elements of his mosquito fleet, one tug and two patrol craft under that bridge and try to force their way past the Russian Federal Security Bureau Navy Coast Guard that was out there and make it into Mariupol as a show of strength or a show of force. It didn't work. The Russians uh, intercepted uh, this three ship sag. They rammed that tug. They fired on the patrol craft, which healed two, and they took 27 Ukrainian sailors, officers, and chiefs prisoner. 
put them in one of the worst dungeons uh, that Amnesty International tracks in Moscow and held them for two years. The fact that they were in uniform made this uh, an extreme violation of the Geneva Convention. And those men were later traded uh, for Russians uh, in a bridge of spies kind of trade two years later when they came back as heroes to the Ukraine. But once again, the Russians showing their true colors to us. Well, we didn't stop trying to help them. And in this picture, you will see two of the island class Coast Guard cutters in the background that were excess defense articles. And the flag officer in the front row who's wearing service dress blues with the stripes is Rear Admiral Matt Zirkle. Matt was my chief of staff. I sent him to Odessa to turn these vessels over and commission them in the Ukrainian Navy. We since gave them two additional Coast Guard cutters and we gave them Mark VI patrol craft, which are no good against large Russian vessels, but it gave them an opportunity in the Ukraine to patrol their coastline. The other thing that we didn't do, unfortunately, was put weapons on those Coast Guard cutters. They had a forward deck mount, a gun, but it was taken off. They were stripped of all weapon systems. And uh, had we had a chance to do it over again, I think we would have done it differently. We would have done a lot of things differently. For instance, we should have started the flow of lethal weapons into Ukraine right after the illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. If that's all water under the bridge or in a naval officer's terms, past CPA and opening, that's in our wake right now. We can't do anything about it. And so now we're trying to flow lethal arms and weapons into the country. And those, uh, those pipelines are getting harder and harder as the Russians take additional territory. The next thing that happened that should have been a warning to us was what my British friend, Vice Admiral Keith Blount, who is the head of Maritime Command in Northwoods outside of London, called the carpet bombing of the northern part of the Black Sea. The Russians laid down closure areas all the way around Crimea and up towards uh, the northern port of Odessa. They're intended to be used as part of warnings to mariners, to commercial ships, to fishermen, that a military exercise is about to take place. Typically, they last for about two weeks. We do this off the East Coast of the United States all the time. I'm a submariner, I'm an East Coast sailor, and oftentimes when we're doing torpedo exercises off in New London, uh, we get into a bridge-to-bridge -bridge, uh, altercation with fishermen who had their nets out, and it was the Navy that always took a knee and said, okay, and we moved on into another area and did something else. So it doesn't mean you own that portion of the ocean. And usually there's a set time frame which you put these things out like a couple of weeks. Well, these closure areas appeared in March of 2021 and they exist to this day. That was a precursor to what has become an invasion of the rest of Ukraine. Last year, and I participated in many of these things, we had an exercise uh, called Seabreeze. Seabreeze started out as US Navy and Ukraine and it migrated into something really big. So last year's sea breeze exercise to help the Ukraine had more ships than in the history of any sea breeze exercise. And I was over there for nine years. So that's pretty impressive. A couple of those ships were NATO ships like the HMS Defender, one of the Dutch frigates that participated. Uh, somebody, presumably the Russians, uh, started to meddle with the automatic uh, identification system required by the UN Convention on Law of the Sea for all ships over 300 metric tons weight. Uh, it's typically used to track ships in the open ocean. And the information that's contained in AIS, that's the acronym, is the master of the vessel, the flag of the vessel, what country is it registered in, the cargo on board, the last destination, the next destination, and a number of other technical specifications and a track so you know where that vessel is. Somebody went into that system and altered it and moved the Dutch frigate and the British destroyer off the coast of Sebastopol. Now, when I first heard about this, and I don't know that anybody has done the required forensics to prove it because we, we were overcome by events with the invasion of Ukraine, but when I first heard about it, uh, there was no doubt in my mind that this was perpetrated by the Russians. 
And then I thought, uh, how dangerous that was. So you are putting two tracks of two ships off the coast of Sevastopol, where the Russian Federation had the preponderance of the Black Sea Fleet. So any Russian vessel getting ready to get underway would see in its intelligence picture the presence of NATO warships off its coast. The inference would be they're here to do something to do harm to us. So when you go to sea with that mental mindset, your mindset is you're on guard, your shields are up, and you may have a hair trigger. You know, that happened to us one other time in our history in 1964 in the Gulf of Tonkin, and it ended up in a war with Vietnam. So extremely uh, careless, unprofessional, and dangerous behavior on the part of somebody, presumably the Russians. Since this campaign has taken fold in Ukraine, the Russians have moved ships from Murmansk in the Northern Fleet, from Kaliningrad in the Baltic Fleet, down into the Black Sea, and they were able to run right through uh, the Bosphorus Straits under the Treaty of Montreux, because technically speaking, according to the treaty, which is uh, managed very well by our Turkish allies, there was nothing wrong with that as long as they put their request in you know, 14 days in advance and they didn't exceed tonnage. They are a Black Sea nation, so they're allowed more than any other nation would be that was a non-Black Sea nation. But when they moved six Rapuchka class amphibious assault ships, that's got a crew of about 100. It can carry tanks, armor, artillery, and hundreds of soldiers. There was no doubt in my mind that that was preparation for an amphibious invasion. The other thing that they did months in advance was to move almost all of the Caspian Sea fleet through the Volga River into the Sea of Azov and essentially cut off access to the Sea of Azov. Now, back when the Kerch Strait was built, back when the Mosquito Fleet in 2018 uh, tried to make its way up to Mariupol, was intercepted and taken prisoner by the Russians, I made a statement publicly that uh, this protocol worked for Vladimir Putin and the Russian Federation. And because it worked once, they may try it again to export that model to the rest of the Black Sea. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing today. There's probably uh, 40 ships uh, in the Sea of Azov and another 35 in the Black Sea right now. And six of those are the new hybrid Kilo class submarines that are patrolling in the Black Sea. Uh, so the Russians technically have maritime control and maritime dominance of the Black Sea. And these are international waters that we have sailed in before, NATO ships have sailed in. And as a naval officer, that causes me pause, it gets me very upset. So here you see the state, the conflict today with this uh, boa constrictor around the perimeter of uh, Ukraine, uh, pressurizing and squeezing uh, the capital of Kyiv. Uh, on the right, you see some of the atrocities. Uh, this is the woman, uh, source of the BBC, that photograph, who was wounded in a maternity hospital. She was about to give birth. Uh, she went unconscious into a coma, and uh, unfortunately, we lost uh, her and her baby. And that, there's no doubt about it, that's a war crime. This is the state of the Ukrainian Navy today. That wonderful ship that they were so proud of, the Hemet Sagadashny, was in Nikolaev shipyard for overhaul. And about uh, two weeks ago, the commanding officer received orders from on high to scuttle his vessel. So that's where she sits today. There's nothing left of the Ukrainian Navy. Those four island uh, Coast Guard cutters that we provided them have been badly damaged or sunk by Russian bombs or Russian missiles. The one thing I can tell you is I am buoyed by the spirit uh, the esprit de corps and the resistance of the Russian forces. And many of you know uh, what this commemorative stamp means by what happened on Snake Island. And so uh, we are all very proud of our Ukrainian friends. My heart goes out to them. I know many of them. I know the two previous CNOs. I think what's happening today is egregious, no doubt about it, war crimes. And I worry about how this conflict is going to end up in the future. And I worry about the migration in the mind of Vladimir Putin uh, to something uh, in terms of weapons of mass destruction, 
either the use of chemical weapons or God forbid the use of a tactical battlefield nuclear weapon. Unfortunately, this should have come as no surprise to any of us. And as I've said, those who ignore the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. A quote from Santiana, uh, we should have been providing lethal aid to the Ukrainians as far back as 2014. It would have been much easier to have that material staged on the ground and certainly something in terms of coastal defense batteries uh, to defend against a naval amphibious assault, the likes of which is going on in Mariupol and the likes of which could happen uh, in the port city of Odessa. Uh, but we didn't do that. So we're playing a catch up game now. There are boundaries and limits. You've heard what the president has said about boots on the ground. The same thing applies to boots on the sea. I do not foresee that we're going to put American ships or NATO ships into the Black Sea at this point. The Russians have got the preponderance of force there. And if we're not going to get directly involved in the conflict, then that won't happen until this conflict is over. And I hope uh, that we do go back in there and reestablish a NATO or an American presence in these waters. And uh, likewise, uh, we have not agreed uh, to a no-fly zone. But it just gets harder every day as we see the carnage uh, and the civilian casualties and the destruction of illegitimate targets throughout that country. Let me just stop there. I am more than happy to stay as long as you'd like and answer any of your questions. Admiral, uh, thank you very much. Um, for the first question, it will be my question. There were headlines in the Washington Post, New York Times today, and on CNN about um, uh, Russian ships, one having been sunk and one having, or two others having been hit. Do you know, were those two Russian ships that were already in port in the Black Sea and, and attacked Pierside, or were those, black, were those Russian ships out in the Black Sea? Do you know the answer to that? I saw a picture, Robbie, of uh, a smoking datum from one of those ships. And there's speculation uh, in the media that the one that was uh, hit and burning and smoking with black smoke was a ship that was uh, touted to be uh, a resupply ship. Uh, it was, if it was not in port, it was close to being in port. And uh, it looked to me like that was a very effective artillery barrage uh, by the Ukrainians. Uh, the Ukrainians used to be, uh, that was the field artillery school uh, for the Warsaw Pact. It was up near uh, Kherson. And so that's where everybody trained. Uh, they're really good at this, uh, pinpointing a target and hitting a target. And uh, the fact that uh, they successfully hit this one or possibly three Russian ships uh, is absolutely amazing uh, with the amount of uh, force that Russia has on the ground. So they were able to pinpoint it. Uh, they were able to uh, launch a strike. And uh, if not sink, then certainly disable. The fire on board that ship looked pretty bad. The other thing would be uh, if the Russians try to repair that ship, they don't have a lot of uh, capability in the theater. They probably have to get it back to Sevastopol in order to repair it. And that defeats the purpose. Uh, there's also a huge... Uh, uh, a morale issue here with not just the troops on the ground who don't have enough food and don't have enough fuel to proceed to their objectives, but also to the Navy, who probably up until this point thought they were invulnerable, and they're not. Uh, the one thing I saw on the morning newscast is as that ship was burning, others scrambled to get away from the pier. So uh, not only did the Ukrainian forces push back Russian forces almost 34 kilometers outside of Kyiv yesterday in their counter assault. But now they've pushed elements of the Russian Navy uh, out of port as well. Uh, this is not going well for the Russians. And I hope that the Ukrainians can keep this up over the long term. I don't know that anybody foresaw that the Ukrainians would be this effective and still uh, in combat operations after 30 days. Well, that, that leads to another question that we propose to you. How do you explain what some would say is the, the abysmal, that's probably too strong, but I'll use it, the, the abysmal performance of the Russian military? My thinking on this, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, uh, 
I think we painted them as 10 feet tall uh, during the illegal annexation of Crimea. And remember, not a shot was fired. Uh, you know, Malkarov came in as the Chad. He was supposed to be the reformer, make them light, more agile. Uh, we did this in our own military. Anytime that a potential NATO country uh, aspired to NATO membership, we would start with a uh, partnership for peace. And Ukraine is a partnership for peace nation. And then when they had uh, downsized, uh, one of the problems in Eastern Europe was too many general officers, too many uh, chiefs uh, in the ratio of chiefs to Indians. And uh, so they'd have to shed the, the heavy headquarters element uh, the tail, as we talk about in tooth to tail, the, the tooth or the, the shooters, the fighters, the tail is the administrative element that goes along with that. And they'd have to get lighter and uh, more mobile and agile. Uh, the armies that were left over after the Cold War were heavy, a lot of uh, mechanized infantry, a lot of tanks. And uh, so the same thing for the Russians. When they went through that reform, they became lighter, more agile, like our Marine Corps. And that's why uh, they looked impressive when they walked into Ukraine without their, their unit identification badges on. And nary a shot was fired, uh, but they were able to take over facilities and bases and infrastructure and entire fleet. And essentially, uh, the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian Navy gave up. Uh, so we thought, wow, uh, the reforms of Makarov and General Gerasimov have worked. Uh, General Gerasimov's reputation became one of mythic proportions. He was even credited with uh, creating this strategy called the Gerasimov Doctrine. He himself would deny that in uh, you know, his speeches and his papers at the War College. Uh, but in fact, we thought it was true. What we found out in this campaign is that uh, the Russian uh, ground forces are poorly led, poorly trained, and they have no logistics supply line, and they rely on conscripts. Uh, we're an all-volunteer force for a reason, and that's a good reason to keep an all-volunteer force. They pushed the conscripts to the front. Uh, lines of communication were poor. Uh, orders and clarity on objectives and how to get there were terrible, and they ran out of gas, and they ran out of food, and that stopped that 40 kilometer armored column heading into Kyiv and made them sitting ducks for what was left of the Ukrainian Air Force and that very effective artillery until it was probably a week and a half, uh, 10 days later, before somebody came along and said, get into a defilade position, a covered position, uh, use terrain territory and the cover of uh, trees overhead uh, to shield yourself from these attacks that are taking place. And so uh, they're not 10 feet tall. And the other uh, issue is that whenever the Russians do an exercise, a training exercise, uh, it's completely different the way we do it. I remember I commanded uh, a Trident Juncture. That was 50,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, 70 ships, almost 300 aircraft, and 10,000 tanks or, tanks or rolling vehicles in Norway. Uh, when we trained, we trained. We were over there for a couple months. And the worst uh, conditions of the year in October and November, very snowy, very wet, icy, uh, you know, you have to worry about frostbite exposure and that sort of thing. Uh, the Russians had done an exercise just the previous six months called Vostok. We had 50,000 troops, they boasted 300,000 troops. And I think the reason for that is they don't really have 300,000 troops. They take one unit out of a bigger unit, say a company out of a brigade or a platoon out of a battalion, and they claim credit for the entire battalion and the entire brigade. Then when they go out on maneuvers, they don't really train. They go out, they establish a base camp, and then they go home. They don't do like we do and evaluate themselves, conduct continuous process improvement, and get better at the skill of warfighting. And the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in the war. You've heard that, uh, that proverb before. That's really true. So all of this came down on the Russians, and nobody, neither the United States or NATO or the Russians anticipated the kind of resistance, fierce resistance from the Ukrainians. And part of that is due to uh, some pretty good NATO training. I mean, we, you saw me in, in Ukraine, we're trying to help their Navy. There were a lot of other folks that were in there, professionals, Americans, Europeans, trying to make them a better army and a fighting force and trying to make them a better air force. And that really paid off for the Ukrainians. It didn't pay off for the Russians.
Do you think the, uh, the, the Russian Navy is as poorly led as the Russian Army and Air Force? No, I don't. Uh, because of my interaction uh, with the Russian Navy in a 40-year career, first thing about the surface Navy, let's set out uh, the difference between the uh, surface Navy and the submarine force, which uh, I probably know best. Uh, the surface Navy went from being a very heavy Navy, uh, one that they couldn't afford, and one that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union because of our cost-imposing strategy and pressurizing them up in Murmansk and Nikola with that great strategy from 1986, the maritime strategy of uh, uh, Secretary John Lehman. Uh, so the Russian Navy downsized and they went uh, smaller and more agile. Uh, lots of slick frigates like the Starogushi that was out during ball tops in 2015 and 16. I commanded both those exercises. They shattered us. They're pretty good at intelligence gathering. They're lousy at aircraft carrier ops. The Kuznetsov that uh, I saw come out during my time as Sixth Fleet Commander and head down into Syria to support that operation for the Russians. Uh, I got their, uh, their dander up when I made a public statement because that ship came into the Mediterranean blowing black smoke because it had engineering problems and unable to really launch and recover aircraft. Uh, when they tried, they actually lost aircraft. So I referred to it as a row run, a roll on roll off ship that just carried aircraft uh, down to Syria and then lifted them onto the pier so they could fight the fight in Syria. So they have one carrier was in dry dock and the, the, there was a failure and a fire in dry dock and they almost lost that one carrier and it went into an overhaul and I don't think it'll ever come out with the economic sanctions we've laid on. So their surface Navy is not much and the United States Navy would, uh, would make a, a quick uh, cannon fodder out of them in a, a matter of days or weeks. Their submarine force Quite a different story. The design bureau that was uh, headed uh, by uh, Igor Spassky since the 1960s, uh, a brilliant engineer uh, who built from November all the way through the Akula class. And uh, uh, you remember the Alpha class, the deep diving submarine, titanium hull went really fast. We're all impressed with that. They have poured a lot of rubles into the undersea domain because they know it's asymmetric. It's an asymmetric threat that can threaten us. They have the Severod Vinsk out now, which is a very important and uh, impressive platform, lethal in fact. And uh, my friend, uh, Admiral Dave Johnson, when he was the PEO for the submarine force, program executive officer, had a scale model of Severod Vinsk built and placed in Naval Sea Systems Command in the Washington Navy. And he would tell his engineers, that's the competition, beat it. It's a really good submarine. They now have the Beograd, which is a submarine that could carry the Poseidon now, Putin revealed this. It was almost like it was a mistake, but I think it was done with malice of forethought. The Poseidon torpedo, which the Russians claim is nuclear powered, can transit across the Atlantic Ocean and you know, could potentially have a nuclear warhead. Beograd's supposed to carry that, and it has a mini sub, and they can threaten our uh, undersea critical infrastructure. That's something that Alfred Thayer Mahan never imagined when you know, he was writing uh, History of Sea Power back in the late 1800s, that probably the most important slock sea line of communication today is on the bottom of the ocean. It carries 95% uh, of our you know, competitive market information and also our classified information, not just across the Atlantic, but everywhere in the world. So um, they have a professional Navy. Uh, in some cases, they failed in carrier development. When they are at sea, they act professionally. Uh, I had problems with the Russian Air Force and the Baltic and the Black Sea. They would come out and uh, they were hot dog pilots. They would take excessive risk. And we often categorized their actions as unsafe and unprofessional. And once a year, we had an opportunity to get together and talk about that, Robbie. And that was the Ink Sea Agreement that's been around since 1972. The Russians used to come to Naples annually for that agreement. It would be uh, one year in Moscow, one year in Naples. And we would sit down and each side would have X number of notches in their bayonet. And we would say on this date, at this time, in this body of water, you conducted an unsafe and unprofessional intercept with your aircraft, or you came dangerously close with your ships and you violated this rule of the road. And they would come back and say, well, you did this on this date. And after a day, we would agree that there were all of these things that had taken place that were wrong. And 
we would have a handshake and go out to dinner and decide that we're going to do better. Uh, the fact that we could actually have that dialogue is important. I'm not sure we're going to have that dialogue in the future. But overall, I see uh, naval officers acting more professionally than what I see with this undisciplined rabble on the ground uh, in the Russian armed forces. And the other thing I forgot to mention earlier was they have no non-commissioned officer corps. They don't have sergeant majors. They don't have uh, platoon sergeants, first sergeants. They don't have chief petty officers, chiefs of the boat, command master chiefs that take care of the enlisted personnel. And if an officer is disabled in a combat situation, those NCOs can you know, pick up the flag and run with it. Um, they haven't paid attention to that. Uh, they don't run a professional force. They, they have conscripts and these conscripts are typically uh, treated with disdain. That's why they're on the front lines. It kind of reminds me of that movie with Jude Law, uh, you know, the, the gates of uh, Stalingrad. So uh, I think all of these things uh, came to fruition and have paralyzed the Russian armed forces. Admiral, thank you very much. Uh, Roy, I'm gonna, uh, our President Roy Gutman, I'm going to go to you next. Yes, just to follow up on a question that we put to you, uh, Admiral. Uh, it is, um, the, the Russians have a significant number of warships there on the coast of uh, the Black Sea coast. Uh, and certainly the, they were uh, preparing for a, an amphibious landing. But other than in Mariupol, it, I don't think that's taken place. Uh, have you heard any, anything to explain uh, that hesitation? There are some rumors out there that there's even been mutinies by the, by the uh, sailors on board or the military men on board the ships. And then secondly, what, what about uh, the Ukrainian uh, military? Is the United States supplying them with uh, missiles or with other weapons that can be used to counter the uh, Russian fleet? Yeah, Roy, that's a great question. And uh, so there is this preponderance of force in the Black Sea. They've got one Slava cruiser, which was the one that attacked Snake Island uh, and got the response from the Ukrainians that's become uh, stoic and heroic and iconic, <laughs> hence that slide. And um, uh, by the way, that's very close to the mouth of the Danube River. The Danube is used by a lot of our European counterparts and particularly by the Romanians it's in their territory to get com uh, commercial ships in and out of Europe. And uh, they can bring things into the Danube and transit around the Black Sea without having to go through the Bosphorus if the Bosphorus was ever shut down or we ever had any problems with Turkey. <clears throat> so that uh, mouth of that body of water is very important. And it's just miles away from Snake Island, which the Russians now control. Uh, those Rapuchka class uh, amphibious assault ships uh, that I mentioned, uh, they left the Northern Fleet and the Baltic fleet on January 15th. And as far as I know, they've been afloat ever since. <clears throat> so I don't know what kind of uh, supplies they had on board. Typically our ships go out, you know, you keep a submarine out for six months uh, with the food on board. But I'm sure that those supplies are dwindling. I haven't heard any reports of mutiny, although that, that might change today after the strike on those uh, three ships up near Mariupol. Uh, they have not conducted an amphibious landing in Odessa. And you remember about two weeks ago, uh, President Zelensky uh, made an announcement that they were about to attack Odessa. So the people of Odessa sandbagged everything uh, off the piers and moved into the town of Odessa. I've been there, it's a beautiful town, many museums and churches of both uh, Ukrainian Orthodox and Ru Russian Orthodox. And there are mixed families in that town that have families in Russia. Uh, so I don't think that's the reason that they haven't moved to shore in Odessa. They want Odessa because that gives them, that, that seals the land bridge from Russian territory all the way down to the Black Sea. And it takes away access for the Ukrainians to the Black Sea because that's their only major port now that Mariupol has been crushed and they have control of the Sea of Azov. If they were to go ashore with that uh, amphibious assault force, I don't think they'd get very far. Uh, there are beaches off of Odessa, and it is a port, so it would be uh, like a landing at Inchon, where Marines were you know, going over bollards onto piers. They could land on the beach and move those uh, mechanized armored vehicles off of the amphibious assault ships, but 
I don't think they'd get very far inland before they ran into the same kind of resistance we've seen in Kherson, Erpin, Kiev, and other cities that have put up uh, an incredible fight. And I think that's what they're worried about. And they're hedging their bets. So they have taken a step backwards and uh, changed their tactics to long range fires, as we would call them uh, in our vernacular in the United States. They're launching missiles from the Black Sea. The caliber cruise missile uh, that I talked about is carried by submarines and surface ships. It's nothing more than you know what I call the, the tomahawk ski, the Russian version of a tomahawk, an air breather with a warhead, pinpoint accuracy, uh, could go over a thousand kilometers. And I used to tell my European friends, you should be aware of these six kilos that are in the Black Sea because they have caliber missiles. You'll never see them launch and they could hit any European capital from the Caspian, from the Black Sea, from the Baltic Sea, from the Arctic, or from the North Atlantic, or from the Mediterranean. And a lot of folks would, would say, hey, that's great, Admiral, but that's never going to happen. Well, I think people are thinking twice about that right now. And uh, that NATO meeting today, I think, uh, portends uh, a greater portion of the budget for defense for Europe and probably for the United States in the future. And it may impact our plans to pivot yet again another time to the Pacific. That pivot could turn into something that looks more like a pirouette. Uh, so we're going to have to sort these out. But for right now, uh, I'm glad that the Russians haven't gone ashore in Odessa because that just means, you know, more destruction. But if they start shelling or throwing missiles into that city, that's going to have some ramifications for them because of the, the cultural importance of that city like Lviv, a UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site. All those churches and all those uh, connections between Russians and Ukrainians and Odessa, uh, maybe that's factored into their, uh, their planning, but they don't seem to care much about that. They've taken a, a more of a barbarian attitude about uh, destroying civilian infrastructure and uh, conducting collateral damage, which we go to great lengths uh, to avoid. Admiral, thank you. Uh, there are a number of questions. Here is a question from uh, Ms. Steinman. Uh, she asked, what would Ukraine have to do to meet the NATO membership standards? Over to you. They are a partnership for peace nation. Uh, up until the time of this conflict, one of the biggest problems Ukraine had was corruption. And uh, President Zelensky came along from President Poroshenko, uh, he was an actor, comedian, as we all know. And I think, uh, you know, progress uh, in that country uh, with uh, things that governments normally do were much harder than they would be in a democracy like the United States. So building an armed force, making sure that uh, nobody was skimming off the top, that uh, allocations for defense were actually going into defense that your industrial base was producing uh, equipment and uh, ships and aircraft and armored vehicles that were intended to protect the troops instead of skimping on uh, military requirements and military specifications. So it was rampant throughout the country. And that's something that uh, NATO was cognizant of and the European Union was also cognizant of. If anything, however, I think the Ukrainians have proved themselves to be a very effective fighting force. Uh, but when you look at the speeches that President Zelensky has made over the last 10 days to parliaments in the United Kingdom, to uh, Israel, to the United States, uh, to Italy, I think he's resolved in his own mind that they're not going to be NATO members anytime soon, uh, particularly prior to the conflict, because we thought it would exacerbate Putin that it would add more to his fears of encirclement. Uh, it is indeed unfortunate. I think that uh, Ukraine could be an effective member of NATO if we had given them the opportunity to prove themselves with a membership action plan, uh, but we never did. And uh, we've held them in abeyance for eight years and they were frustrated by it. I think President Zelensky now is saying to himself, we're not gonna be members of NATO, so." Why bother asking anymore if we can't get the no-fly zone? We are getting weapons, which is great, but it's not enough. 
And so as he thinks of uh, a dialogue uh, with the Russians in these supposed peace negotiations, uh, speculation now, and it's you, you read it like I do on social media, is that Ukraine may adopt uh, a policy of neutrality, and uh, they may end up uh, giving up some of their territory uh, in order for the withdrawal of Russian troops. But I wouldn't trust a Russian guarantee any more than a man. Anymore. Admiral, based on the comment that you just made about some skimming off the top and corruption, is there any merit at all to Putin's claim about neo-Nazis in Ukraine? Absolutely zero, Robbie. Um, <clears throat> when I was in Odessa, there were groups. In fact, uh, when uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk came to visit, uh, he left the capital of Kiev uh, to come to Odessa on a day that they were voting on autonomy for the Donbass region, for uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. And somebody didn't like that. So they tossed a hand grenade at the parliament building and killed a police officer. He told me that when we, we talked for hours. And I said to him, was that a pro-Russian uh, militia group that did that? And he said, oh, no, no, no. This was a group that was uh, uh, against autonomy for Donbass. They were a pro-Ukrainian group, but on the fringes, uh, on the far right. You know, we have the same kind of thing in our country. I mean, look what just happened uh, in January 6th in the Capitol. And so uh, I don't think there's uh, any remnant of Nazism in the country. I think that's all made up by Vladimir Putin. I mean, how many times have you heard on the news that after all, President Zelensky is Jewish. I watched a one hour session between he and Fareed Zakaria on Global Public Square on Sunday, many of you probably saw it, when he explained his family roots and his father who had served in the war, uh, fighting the Germans in the war on the Russian side and uh, lost uh, relatives, uncles. Uh, the Germans came in, the Nazis came in and, and destroyed villages and killed his family members. Uh, some of them were deported uh, in the Holocaust. And so uh, there's, absolutely not one iota of that uh, in his body or in his history or his chronology, chronology as a uh, Jewish citizen of the Ukraine. So uh, completely specious arguments on the part of Vladimir Putin. But the problem is uh, the state control of media in Russia has convinced people that that's true. And uh, uh, I think they have no idea what's going on on the ground because they're not allowed to see it. And what's a real tragedy here is if these casualty statistics are accurate, uh, the Ukrainians have been publishing a report every day called UNCLASS, called the War Report. And when I first saw it, I thought perhaps the numbers were inflated when they were claiming thousands of Russian troops killed. But uh, just today after the NATO summit, our DOD says likely 7,000 Russians killed in action. NATO says as many as 15,000. The Ukrainian count is over 20,000. When you think about all that armor that's been destroyed by Javelin missiles and those aircraft that have been down, there's three or four guys in every tank that's operating. And if that tank gets hit by an armor piercing round, you know, all those carcasses of tanks out there, are, they probably haven't taken the killed in action Russian soldiers out of them. So I don't know that we'll ever get an accurate count, uh, but this is significant. And that's being held back from the Russian people. Eventually, it'll get out because, uh, you know, Admiral Mullen used to ask, when it, whenever he went to a combat zone, he would say things like, what about the mothers? And folks wondered what he was talking about. You know, we were dealing with this in Afghanistan, in our country, when we repatriated uh, our, our heroes home at Dover Air Force Base and did a dignified transfer of remains. And uh, he always worried about the troops and he worried about the mothers. He wrote letters to all the the parents or survivors of family members that were killed in Afghanistan. The Russians don't really care. Uh, you know, they've got these uh, mobile crematoriums that travel around after the troops. You talk about a morale buster. You know, if I'm the guy in the frontline tank or I'm, I'm the conscript in the infantry up forward, and I don't take any solace in, in the fact that there's a mobile crematorium five kilometers behind me. Not at all. 
you know, I, I want my family to know what happened to me and uh, that I fought bravely, but they may never know. But they're going to figure it out when their sons and daughters don't come home. And uh, maybe that's the wake up call. I don't know how long it'll take, but I hope it happens sooner than later. So public opinion continues to turn against this tyrant, Vladimir Putin. Wow, what a statement. Uh, Admiral, here's an easy one for you. Uh, Mr. Saxton asked this question. Would the Russian Navy be able to transit the Bosphorus and the Dardanelles today, or would they be stopped by Turkey? That's an excellent question, sir. Uh, it took Turkey a little while. I have, uh, in my headquarters in uh, Naples, Italy, uh, where I served uh, over seven years, uh, I had uh, Greek flag officers, Turkish flag officers. There was a lot of tension there uh, over violations of airspace and uh, encroachment on islands that were Greek islands or Turkish islands, and uh, Greeks would come close to them. And I would always try to deconflict that. I first started out with saying, uh, remember the Lunds doctrine. Joseph Lunds was a, a, a diplomat and the Secretary General of NATO back in the 1960s for you know eight years or something, like over a decade. And Lunds uh, uh, established something called the Lunds Doctrine, and that is if the allies of this great alliance have bilateral issues and differences, take it out of my chamber in the North Atlantic Council and go work it out yourselves. Well, that came to a head over you know, things like arguments over Cyprus or arguments over sea space or airspace. And uh, I would always say, it is much better to have the Turks as part of the alliance than to have the Turks outside of the alliance. Uh, Turkey has a very capable military. And any time I put in a mantra request as Sixth Fleet Commander or as the One Star Operations Officer for Sixth Fleet or as Naval Forces Europe, I do not remember a time when, when the paperwork was done correctly and the timing requirements of you know notification 14 days prior and no more than 21 days inside and no more than X amounts of tons of U.S. shipping a non-Black Sea nation when we uh, abided by those rules, they let us in. So this time I kind of wondered what was going to happen. When I saw those Rapuchka class ships leave the Northern Fleet and the Baltic Sea Fleet and head down uh, to the Black Sea, there was no guarantee they were gonna go in the Black Sea. And in my head, I calculated about a 14 day transit time at a fairly high speed. They're flat bottom ships and naval officers know that's very uncomfortable to be in the North Atlantic coming around from Murmansk and out into the open ocean of the Atlantic and into the Mediterranean in the wintertime. So it must've been a pretty lousy ride. Well, 15 days later, they entered the Black Sea. They put in a request, they are Black Sea nations and the, the Turks let them go in. Uh, the Turks could have said no on suspicion that they might be involved in the conflict that we're in today, but they had no legal reason to do so. So after a couple of weeks into the conflict where Russia had referred to this as a crisis and not a war, uh, the, the Turkish foreign minister, uh, Kavasoglu came out and said, this is not a crisis. This is not arbitrary missile attacks on uh, port facilities. This is a war. And in time of war, the Montreux Convention says that nobody should be allowed to go through the Bosphorus unless you're a Black Sea nation and the vessels transiting is home ported in the Black Sea. Those Rapuchkas are not home ported in the Black Sea. That big Slava cruiser that attacked Snake Island is home ported in Sevastopol. The submarines are another story. Once they go in, they're not supposed to come out. But there is a provision in the Montreux Treaty that allows you to come out to do maintenance outside. So that's what the Russians do, they declare. Again, no legal reason for the Turks to say no. So uh, about two weeks ago when Kavasoglu made this declaration, he asked everybody not to transit the Bosphorus. And as far as I know, NATO hasn't gone in there and the Russians haven't come out. And I don't think they've sent anything else in. Why should they? They've got 75 ships in Sea of Azov and the Black Sea. They have plenty of force. Now, if they started to lose ships, would they try to go through with reinforcements? Would the two Slavas in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Aegean suddenly appear and put in a mantra request or just 
drive through without asking permission. What would happen then? Again, we set ourselves up for an altercation between a NATO ally, Turkey, or anybody else that's out there helping control that region, and a Russian ship. And that could lead to a mistake, a miscalculation. You know, the famous term you hear on TV from all the talking heads, a kinetic exchange, which means you're shooting one another. And that invariably would lead to a World War III scenario. I agree with President Biden on this, as much as I don't like it as a naval officer. If the United States is going to do something about this, we're going to have to go to war with Russia. And I think most people would want to prevent that in a war between two nuclear superpowers, because the ramifications are much broader than what's happening in this region today. Great question, sir. Uh, Admiral, uh, two related questions. A, a, a colleague of Roy's and mine, uh, Mr. Dell, uh, asked Roy and myself earlier this week that he had read that the Russian uh, uh, Pacific Fleet or Asian Fleet was en route to the Black Sea. W would the ships from the Russian Asian Fleet or Pacific Fleet, would they be allowed to enter the Black Sea Per the Montreux Convention? That's another great question. Coming from the Asian fleet or Vladivostok around, technically speaking, those ships are not home ported in the Black Sea. So there is a provision or an article that deals with that. But to, if the Russians tried to force their way in, then the Turks would have to do something about it. And the big question is would the Turks do anything about it? I'm sure that the Turks wouldn't make this decision in isolation. They would consult with NATO headquarters. And what would NATO say about it? To this date, NATO has said no fly zone, no boots on the ground. Uh, this is a very prickly question that has not come up because we haven't run into this situation yet, but it would be uh, a difficult policy decision for Turkey to make or for NATO to make. So we'll have to see what happens. Well, this is an easy one. Uh, th this is from Mr. Wolf. He says, is the U.S. Sixth Fleet barred from the Black Sea? The United States Navy in general, Mr. Wolf, will and can go anywhere that it wants to project power and to represent our sovereign interests throughout the globe, with one exception. We don't go inside people's territorial waters. Territorial waters are from zero to 12 miles from sea in accordance with the UN Convention on Law of the Sea. Then you have an economic zone up to 250 miles. Sometimes, like the USS Yorktown and Bezobotny, that elision of the Russian ship on the American ship was due to the fact that we disagreed with the Russians' baselines. They wanted to draw a 12 mile line instead of a, an arc between two points of land, and we say, well, that's the 12 mile point. They wanted to extend it out uh, according to where the geography jutted into the ocean. We didn't agree with that. That gave them more territorial sea, so we challenged it, and that's what happened. Generally speaking, we can go anywhere we want. Now, the Turks have asked uh, all parties, all nations, not to transit through the Black Sea. This came from their foreign minister uh, while the war is on, uh, if you're not a Black Sea nation. Uh, if the United States Navy felt it necessary to go into the Black Sea, we would find a way to do it. I hope that the United States Navy will get back into the Black Sea after this uh, crisis has subsided, and we'll do it the same way we've always done it, in accordance with the rules and in accordance with respect for Turkish sovereign territory, and we'll submit a Montreux Declaration, and we'll go in. Emerald, thank you. We are so appreciative of your being with us. Okay, here, here is a, a question from um, Mr. Wolf. He says, I understand the red lines and potential kinetic confrontation in, your, in Ukraine and cautionary issues. What about red lines in the cyber area? Does the concern to avoid MAD hold here? Mutual assured destruction. Yeah, Mr. Wolf, another great question. And this is something that's been debated in the chambers of NATO for a few years now. 
Um, the United States recognized the threat in cyberspace from cyber warfare about a decade ago. We started to wake up to this. You know, one of our problems in our country is we're fighting two wars in the desert in Iraq and Afghanistan. And sometimes, you know, when I'm in a more critical mode, I will say we not only had our boots in the sand, we had our heads in the sand. And since that time, if you hadn't had a chance to read it, uh, take a look at the National uh, Security Council report on artificial intelligence. It's available online. Uh, it's an exceptionally good report uh, done by Eric Schmidt and uh, uh, a number of commissioners that were commissioned to do this. And it essentially lays out this uh, roadmap that the Chinese took advantage of uh, during the time that we were engaged in the nation's wars uh, to try to move ahead of the United States in cyberspace and artificial intelligence. We're really good at it. The Chinese are really good at it. The Russians are good at it. The Iranians are good at it. And you see that every day. The shutdown of the colonial pipeline, for example, in this country, election interference in this country, and some of the other things that have happened with our networks. Uh, North Korea has even done this to Sony, you recall that a few years ago. And so, uh, you know, we added additional domains uh, to our warfighting doctrine. It was originally land, sea, and air. And we woke up and said, the fourth domain, cyber, the fifth domain, space. I submit that there's a sixth domain called logistics. I think the Russians have figured that out by now, but it's not official. So it took NATO a little while to follow the lead of the United States. But a few years ago, they also adopted cyber and space as legitimate domains that uh, NATO was going to have to deal with. Then the next question came up, well, what happens when there's a, a non-kinetic attack down a fiber optic cable to something like the Colonial Pipeline, or many years ago to the country of Estonia, which essentially attacked infrastructure and government institutions and banking systems and shut that country down for a couple of weeks. As a response, NATO created a center of excellence and talent in Estonia, and it's been in, uh, in function uh, for years now. And so then the debate uh, inside NATO, is a non-kinetic strike down a fiber optic cable on a NATO ally, does that constitute an Article 5? An attack on one is an attack on all. They talked about that last week. Now, we suffered uh, uh, this kind of thing with not just the pipeline, but uh, uh, other elements of uh, you know, our national power uh, and our civilian agencies and some of our commercial industries as well. We haven't declared war on it, but um, it's a question that could potentially come up in the next weeks, months, or a year, and we're going to have to deal with it. Um, if an Article 5 situation is declared, <clears throat> that means war. That means retaliation. And again, it gets right to your, your last point. Uh, if a cyber attack on a NATO ally or a cyber attack on the United States constitutes an Article 5. And typically what we do in the West is we say, hold on a minute, let's do the forensics and the investigation and figure out who the perpetrator was. And I think we figured out that the perpetrators of the colonial pipeline were Russian, but we don't know if it was officially sanctioned by the Russian government or if it was hackers. Well, go figure, you know, my opinion would be a little of both. And so if you want to make that allegation and you want to declare an Article 5, again, that means uh, war uh, with a, another nuclear power. And that's pretty serious. These are really hard decisions for our political leaders to make. And I think uh, they're making them deliberately. They're talking about them advance in advance. And uh, we're going to have to deal with it. Another one that's uh, just around the corner, it was discussed uh, today in Brussels, is what happens if uh, Putin decides to use weapons of mass destruction, a chemical weapon? What are we gonna do about it? And we're gonna have to think through that one very carefully as well. Emma, here's a related question uh, based on your comments just now. And this is from our uh, colleague, um, Mark Solomon, one of our uh, many distinguished colleagues. Mark asked this question, 
Do we have a new red line yet, or is it still attacking a NATO country before we escalate? Admiral, over to you. By the actions of the U.S. government, Mark, I think that, uh, you know, if you go back in history to the use of chemical weapons by uh, Assad, uh, the son of Hafez al-Assad, Bashar al-Assad, against his own people in Aleppo, you know, dropping barrel bombs on women and children and killing a lot of people. Uh, that was a that was proposed. That was something that President Obama said. That's a red line. If he does it, that's a red line. Are we going to act? <clears throat> we didn't act. Following that, uh, you know, it was interesting that the Russians came in. Putin brokered a deal, uh, and a lot of people have forgotten about this. That uh, there's a lot of chemical inventory in Syria. His forces were on the ground in Syria. So he decided to be the great statesman and say, well, I'll uh, broker a deal where the Syrians will give up their chemical weapons and a coalition of forces, including Russians, Chinese, Americans, and others from Europe will ensure that those chemical weapons are destroyed. And back in my time as Sixth Fleet Commander, I watched the United States go from zero to 60 in about 45 days and take one of our maritime administration ships, uh, USS Ray, and put a uh, chemical weapons uh, factory on board that would make these compounds inert, sarin gas and chlorine gas. Uh, one of my Commodores was uh, the guy that commanded that ship and took it over uh, into the Mediterranean and uh, actually stood by as Russian ships and Chinese ships went out and escorted these weapons on container ships out to a neutral place, a third party, where they were loaded on uh, USS Ray, taken out to sea, processed, and turned into fertilizer. Uh, how ironic was that? And then the Russians, uh, when they got bogged down in that uh, civil war that took place in Syria, may not have used the chemical weapons themselves, but they tolerated the use by uh, Assad against his own people. President Trump came along and two years in a row, April of uh, 17 and April of 18, he said, that's a red line and I will punish him severely for that. I was a uh, commander in April 18 when that happened and USS John Warner shot Tomahawk missiles into three Syrian chemical weapons facilities along with elements of the US Navy from the fifth fleet and destroyed them outright. So what are these red lines today? Uh, we've made it quite clear that we will not, uh, at least our policymakers and our government and our leadership from the president on down has made it quite clear, we will not get uh, into a war with Russia unless there's an Article 5 situation, an attack on one of the NATO allies. And the ones that are in close proximity are Romania and uh, Poland and the three Bs in the Baltics, uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. But it could be an attack on anybody else as well. And uh, that's why this uh, no-fly zone and the transfer of MiG-29s was such a big deal because uh, would Putin retaliate and would Putin attack a NATO ally? And we've spent billions of dollars here in the last couple of months reinforcing our Eastern flank. There's 100,000 American troops in Europe now. We haven't seen those numbers since the Cold War. At our peak in Afghanistan, we had 100,000 troops. And so I think in order to uh, you know, meet the definition uh, that you put down on the table of crossing a red line, that would be uh, an Article 5 situation with an attack on one of our 30 members of the alliance. And I firmly believe that the alliance will stand strong. Some uh, tried to discredit the alliance. And they said, well, we would, we would never trade a, a small country uh, like the Republic of Macedonia or Manhattan. I think that the, the NATO charter, uh, which is called the Washington Treaty because it was signed here in Washington, uh, D.C. in 1949, is sacrosanct. And the only time in 74 years that an Article 5 has ever been used, and many of you probably know this, is during 9-11 in the attack on America. And NATO allies uh, came to our side and uh, helped us fight the war in Afghanistan. And we're there 
up until we left last year. Admiral, thank you. I, I got to tell you, the, the questions and the comments on chat have, have just exploded. Great group of folks and great now, questions. Thank you. Here is one from Ryan P. Where do you see Russia and Ukraine in 10 years break? What role do oligarchs play in the Russian military? And your thoughts about the end result to this war? So Ryan, thanks a lot for the question. Great questions. Um, where do I see Russia and the Ukraine in 10 years? I hope the violence stops soon. <clears throat> I think the way to get there, this is just my personal opinion, is that uh, with the cards that we've laid on the table for President Zelensky, uh, and that is, we're going to give you lethal aid. We're not going to give you a no-fly zone. And we're not going to put American and NATO troops on the ground. So you're going to have to continue your negotiations with Russia in this war of attrition. And right now, it's going very badly for civilians in the Ukraine, but it's going very badly for the Russian military in the Ukraine. And sooner or later, some say, General Wesley Clark says that they've reached their level of culmination when a, a force is at its peak strength and its peak effectiveness. They're now on the downslope of that. Uh, being pushed out of Kyiv last night, 34 kilometers away from the city and entrenching themselves, the Russians are out there laying mines now. This is just like what happened in Donbass. So it's heading towards a frozen conflict. Uh, they can do a lot of damage still with uh, long range fires, but they've shot over a thousand missiles. How much more do they have? And uh, how are they gonna replenish those stocks? And with the 200,000 troops that are in Ukraine at 190,000 right now, what is Russia leaving gapped? How are they covering their borders with China? And do they trust China that much or are they just frenemies? And so I think, this, if chemical weapons are not used, and this doesn't go to the use of tactical battlefield nuclear weapons, then the Russians may opt for some kind of agreement uh, that sounds like neutrality. And both sides have got to agree to this. President Zelensky is smart. He said, I won't do anything unless there's a referendum of the Ukrainian people. I don't know how that's going to happen quickly with everybody dispersed. Uh, the way they are. And with the situation on the ground in Ukraine, uh, like it is, there's going to have to be a ceasefire. And then there's going to have to be time given for a referendum to agree to terms. And he's smart because if he's going to agree that Crimea becomes part of Russia, Donbass becomes part of Russia, the Ukrainian people have a right and a say so to either agree or not agree with them. But that's the way today I see this conflict heading in the future. And that kind of answers your last question too. What's the end result? As for the oligarchs, um, I would presume that, well, first of all, Russia's a corrupt country too. Uh, there's people skimming off the top. Uh, you have no idea where money goes. Um, you know, it's hard to, uh, before this conflict, it was hard to do business with the Russians because of that. And uh, the oligarchs have made themselves rich of uh, uh, you know, the sacrifice of the Russian people. Uh, I would presume that when the oligarchs were growing up, that because of conscription, uh, which is uh, widely uh, applied throughout Russia, that some of them actually did military service. But then again, depending on the position of their parents, if there was a way to buy them out of it, maybe they didn't. And so they don't really understand what goes on on a battlefield. Uh, I read a open source report today that one of the most trusted agents of Vladimir Putin, Defense Minister Shoigu, who wears a uniform, but I don't think he knows anything about the operational art, has uh, suddenly got some kind of a heart condition and he's out of the picture. I think Putin's getting very irritated with his closest advisors. He's going to start picking them off one by one just like he did with the foreign intelligence services. He's also now losing patience with the chief of defense, Valery Gerasimov, who was the guy that was the hero that walked into Crimea. My, how his fortunes have changed. And so uh, sooner or later, the oligarchs will lose favor with Putin 
or Putin will lose favor with the oligarchs. And that may be the time that they turn on him. They've certainly lost a lot. They've lost their yachts. They've lost their foreign invent, uh, uh, investments. Uh, they've been sanctioned. They can't travel. I don't know that Aeroflot Airlines will ever fly again because they depend on us for parts. Uh, this uh, load of sanctions I've called the mother of all sanctions has had an absolute crippling effect on the Russian economy. Uh, so the oligarchs have certainly seen their wealth go down the drain. Now, there are countries out there that can help Russia survive throughout this. And it remains to be seen, even the president himself said today in his press conference at NATO, it remains to be seen how effective and how long it takes these sanctions to really uh, bite at the heels of the Russian people and the Russian oligarchs. They take time, but you saw the ruble just tumble down to cents on the dollar in the first couple of days. That's not a comfortable feeling for anybody in Russia who's put their life savings in a Russian bank that trades in rubles. Uh, it's a great credit to us because the most stable currency in the world, as you know, is the, is the dollar. Even the Chinese believe that. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I actually hope that one of the outcomes of this, if it's not neutrality for Ukraine, some kind of a peace deal with Putin and a withdrawal of Russian forces, there's another solution too. And that is the Russian people take care of their own problem and eliminate Putin. Uh, you know, I speak to uh, uh, Russian expats, Ukrainian expats here in Washington, D.C., and my job is the dean of the Center of Maritime Strategy. And uh, to the man or to the woman, they say, this is not the Russian people's war. This is Putin's war. It's not even the Kremlin's war. There's one guy calling the shots, Vladimir Putin. And he's effectively destroyed the empire that he built. He has no place being in power. And perhaps the Russian people will wake up and do something about their problem, their president, Vladimir Putin. Time will tell. Admiral, focusing on the oligarchs, uh, on a scale of one to 10, 10 meaning no question about it, the oligarchs are gonna turn on him. One meaning no way they won't do it. What is your assessment? How likely are the oligarchs to turn on Putin? Unfortunately, Robbie, I think the answer to that is down in the, the low digits, maybe the two or the three. And the reason for that is the, oligar the oligarchs are wealthy. They became wealthy because of Putin. And uh, his treatment of the oligarchs is like a, a, a Gomorra or a mafia family. You know, there's one capo, one boss, one godfather, that's Putin. And he can off any one of them anytime he wants. You know, look what happened to, to some of these people that bucked the system. Khodorovsky that ran uh, Lukoil, the Russian gas company, went to jail for 10 years. He's now in the West sniping away at Putin. And uh, he has the ultimate power to make their lives miserable or end their lives. And I believe they, they fear him. And I don't believe that any of them have any kind of apparatus that could uh, actually raise a force to challenge Vladimir Putin. Uh, that said, he's been the head of intelligence services, KGB, FSB, all of his life. He's never been a soldier in the field, which is why he has no concept of what's going on uh, on the ground with a modern army or his own army, which is ill-equipped, ill-led, and ill-prepared to fight this campaign against the Ukrainians. The other thing that he completely ignored was this is a home field advantage for the Ukrainians. He thought that uh, everybody's just going to open up their doors and allow him to walk in and uh, embrace him as a leader and uh, welcome the fact that Russia would once again be calling the shots in Kiev. It worked that way in Crimea because there was a diaspora of people there that were more pro-Russian. Same thing in the Donbass region. Not so much in the western parts of the country in Kiev and Kherson and Odessa and Lviv. And the last thing I'll say is that Putin has surrounded himself with uh, two cordons of security, uh, loyal stormtroopers uh, that would take a bullet for him. And he has distanced himself from even his friends and family and those oligarchs that you know he once affiliated with and I dare say trusted, but I don't think he trusts anybody. Hence the reason for these long tables when he meets with uh, 
uh, world leaders like President Macron. Uh, I don't think it's COVID that he's worried about. I think it's uh, worse than that, that uh, if somebody gets close to him, that uh, they may try to do him harm. He's paranoid. And uh, he's not going to take any chances. I was really surprised when he went out into uh, the Olympic Stadium in Sochi and made that speech the other night because he looked like he was vulnerable in that crowd. So they had to have done an incredible job at vetting everybody in that audience. And when I looked at the, uh, the steel rafters in the roof, you know, I said to myself, I wonder how they're protecting him from any kind of element up there that might want to do harm to him. You know, that thing looks like the, uh, the bird's nest uh, uh, stadium in uh, Beijing. And uh, I was surprised to see him come out, but that means that he has confidence in his security details probably hundreds or thousands of them to protect him. And so it may be very difficult to get at him. Uh, that said, there is always the power of the people. And, you know, Russia has millions of people. And if there's an uprising, just like there was against Yeltsin, Yeltsin uh, they could overthrow him and box him up in the Kremlin until, you know, they starve him out, form an alternative government. If uh, the chain of command ignores his orders, uh, he's done. He may have uh, that cordon of security around him, but that won't last long. And that was the way of most tyrants and dictators in Eastern Europe when the wall came down. Admiral, one last question before I hand it over to Roy, our, our president. This is a, a, a tactical question, and it's from Manny. Uh, Manny's question is, how dangerous are Russian hypersonic missiles to the U.S. Navy? Hypersonics have our attention. And again, <clears throat> if you think about uh, the 20 years that we fought the war on terror against violent extremist organizations with uh, boots on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and the kinds of tools that you need to fight a war like that, the most valuable tool that you have in the inventory in the United States Marine Corps is the strategic corporal. You know, the squad leader that goes into a village and sits down at Ashura with the tribal chief and offers some protection for his people against the Taliban. Uh, you know, the word of one man to another. In some cases, that didn't work. Uh, ultimately, we had to pull out of uh, Afghanistan. But while we were pouring resources into that war, and, you know, I remember uh, when I was in the Pentagon, they used to call it, uh, they call the monthly expenditure in Afghanistan the burn rate. Uh, you know, it was exceeding $2 billion a month. And the massive amounts of equipment that we lifted, sea lifted and airlifted over there and left there. And so all of our uh, independent research and development and our defense industries went into things that were protecting our troops in the field like the MRAP, you know, the armored vehicle that could not be blown up by uh, an improvised explosive device in the ground or a large explosive charge, 2,000 pound bombs buried out there. And then defeating these systems before you actually ran over them with uh, uh, what we call getting to the left of the kill chain, jamming them using electronic warfare. That's where we paid all of our attention and put our resources. While other nations were putting resources into the undersea domain like the Russians or the cyber domain like the Chinese or artificial intelligence like the Chinese or hypersonics. Hypersonics have been around for a long time. Uh, you know, these are weapons that go anywhere up to six times the speed of sound. I think that dagger missile that the Russians fired the other day in open source reporting in the newspaper, it said it was going 6,000 miles an hour and had a range of over a thousand kilometers. Uh, these uh, weapon systems, if they were able to be perfected by uh, Russia, uh, they're able to be perfected by other nations. And China uh, recently rolled out the DF-17 in a parade. They, that's their hypersonic missile. So these weapons are uh, lethal and important and scary because they go so fast and they can travel such a long distance with little to no warning. Time. And uh, they're very difficult to defend against. That doesn't mean you can't defend against them, but you've got to be ready and on guard to defend against them. And you've got to have effective integrated air and missile defense systems on your ships 
uh, to take them out before they come to your ship. Uh, the other issue is bogging. If lots of these things are fired, you're gonna get some of them, but ultimately you're not going to get all of them. Now, when the Russians used that weapon the other day, the dagger, and hit uh, what they claim to be uh, an arms depot or an ammunition depot inside Ukraine, uh, you probably saw the video reported uh, on TV. Uh, that's another amazing thing is uh, these expeditionary journalists are out there. Some of them are being killed but they're getting the word out. And we're seeing this war, uh, like some of you may have seen during the Vietnam War. I used to watch it when I was a kid on CBS every night. And so we're seeing real time what happens, but much more uh, than we have ever imagined before. Uh, the weapon uh, is difficult to defeat. Uh, it's expensive. I personally don't think the Russians have a lot of them, but they did it on purpose. They wanted to show uh, almost as though it was escalatory, an escalatory thing like we have this weapon it worked uh you can't beat it you have nothing on the ground in the ukraine that can prevent us from hitting you and think of what other high value targets uh that we could uh we could attack with this weapon and uh, i'm sure that uh, set uh, the ukrainians back on their heels as it did us so when you think about fleets at sea and uh you know raids they call it raids of large numbers of hypersonic weapons. Uh, we need to get on with the program. Uh, on WJLA here a couple of weeks ago, I saw my good friend, Vice Admiral Johnny Wolf, who's the head of SSP, talk about research and development in the United States. We are working towards a program uh, of record to produce a very effective hypersonic weapon ourselves. That's great. But you know what I'm more concerned about? How do you defend? How do you defeat, how do you knock down the enemy's hypersonic weapons? Because that's our sailors and our Marines and our soldiers and our airmen that are out there that are having to face this threat. So we need to put as much uh, money and resources into defense as we do offense. And you know how that goes in, in the uh, walls uh, and halls at the Pentagon. And again, on Hap the Capitol Hill, everybody's got an opinion. Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to see as much as uh, some of the American people would, and myself included, I'm a taxpayer, but you know, I'd like to see some money spent on our country uh, in the infrastructure bill is a great start, you know, over a trillion dollars. Uh, but we're probably, as a result of this, going to have to put more money into defense. And that's one of the things that we have to work really hard at. So thanks, Manny, for that question. Great question. Thank you, Admiral, very much. Uh, Roy, uh, Mr. President, over to you. Mr. Uh, Ambassador, I uh, thought your presentation tonight, besides being <clears throat> extensive, was incisive and uh, in many cases definitive. I found your discussion of the long table uh, at which Putin uh, likes to meet foreign leaders and, and his own senior officials uh, was uh, very insightful. Uh, <clears throat> I thought your reference to uh, U.S. policy of uh, the pivot uh, likely to turn into a pirouette. Uh, was uh, very intriguing, and I, it certainly makes a, a lot of sense. Uh, you said something about the reset in the uh, Clinton administration, or rather in the Obama administration, that it actually worked, which is, uh, which is news to me, and, uh, and uh, it puts a new light on it. Uh, what you said about the capabilities of the Russian Navy, uh, it seems to me, was, uh, was really authoritative and very helpful. And what you said about uh, the transit through the Bosporus Straits, uh, was was really the, by far the best explanation I've heard from anywhere. So we thank you for those uh, insights, but also for your overall uh, presentation uh, and, uh, and and frankly your uh, ability to put things in context. Uh, it, it was a great evening. Uh, thank you again, Admiral. Thank you, and thank you to the Baltimore Council. It's been an absolute uh, delight for me, particularly because of your interest, your phenomenal questions, and a great crowd here. Uh, you know, on the uh, pivot versus pirouette, I have to give credit for the term pirouette to my good friend and mentor, General Frank Gorenz, who was a uh, USAFE commander when I conducted operations uh, in Libya back in 2011. And Frank recently uh, came out with this uh, analogy, what are we going to do? Are we going to pivot just to the Western Pacific or are we just going to spin and pirouette back to Europe when we have to? So we, again, we're going to have to spend a little bit more money on defense. And uh, we're going to have to give our young men and women of this country that put their lives on the line 
the best possible kit, whether they're a Marine, an airman, uh, a sailor or a soldier that we can so that, uh, you know, the big difference uh, that becomes obvious between us and the Russians is we care about our Americans in the field. They don't seem to care about their troops. And uh, that all, that is tragic, but uh, if it works against them, I'm all for it. Uh, Robbie, thank you so much for inviting me. Again, uh, mea culpa, and I think it's absolutely fantastic what you're doing. Admiral, we cannot thank you enough. And I want to also thank uh, the many, many of our, our members of the council who submitted any number of questions and comments tonight, which we, we just didn't have time to get to. Thank you very much for that. The participation was simply outstanding tonight. Thanks to the council and Admiral, thanks again to you. You're welcome. Everybody have a great night and uh, hopefully we can do this again. Mm -hmm.